All right, so um, welcome. Uh, we will start the webinar now. Uh, welcome to uh, speakers and participants uh, to this webinar on business and human rights in Southeast Asia, progress towards developing national action plans. Uh, as you see, we will have two panels today. Uh, we will have two panels today, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Uh, let me start by saying uh, at this point that we are uh, grateful for the collaboration with uh, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung in uh, offering uh, to you this webinar and this report that we will launch today. So um, as we uh, prepare to start, kickstart the event in about five minutes, uh, let me note uh, a few things. One is that you will be receiving a link uh, to our live Facebook, Facebook feed. Uh, please kindly help to us to share that with your uh, networks. Okay, uh, so please, please help us to do that. Let me give you some brief guidelines as to the uh, uh, process of this uh, webinar um, that you see before you. The participants upon entry are muted. Uh, this is, these are to ensure the smooth um, um, uh, proceedings of um, considering bandwidth issues and so on. Participants are muted upon entry. The video is permanently disabled for this session, except for the speakers. The Zoom Q&A function or the raise hand function for questions is available to you. Uh, please input your questions via the, uh, the raise hand and the chat functions uh, that you all know very well about uh, by now. And in the chat box, you will also be receiving updates uh, from Asia Center team. Short messages uh, will be put uh, in this chat box. So these are the webinar guidelines. Let me just say a quick word about the Asia Center. The Asia Center is a social enterprise, a think tank and social enterprise uh, based in Bangkok. Based in Bangkok, uh, we do evidence-based research. We do uh, various activities and events, and we undertake media and social uh, media advocacy. I wish to note that we are accredited with the United Nations ECOSOC, which has granted us consultative status, special consultative status. Um, and we look forward to um, collaborating with colleagues as we engage with the United Nations system. Um, moving on to our uh, event uh, next year, um, I would like to call your attention to our seventh international conference on freedom of expression in Asia, which will take place from 24 to 26 August 2022. So we we invite you to contact us uh, to uh, explore collaboration, partnerships, panel partnerships uh, with, for this conference that will take place uh, next year. Now, at this point, um, I would like to uh, just uh, check in with our speakers who are here. Um, uh, Tricia, uh, Tricia uh, Paolo and uh, Moritz Kleinebrockhoff from the uh, 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 Friedrich Naumann Stiftung. Um, uh, Moritz, uh, perhaps uh, if you are there, uh, uh, you would kindly make some uh, opening remarks uh, before we, uh, as we proceed with the webinar. Uh, Moritz? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, can you guys hear me and see yes, me? Yes, please, we can okay. see you. Oh. Great, great. Yeah, on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, it's a great pleasure uh, for me and, and for us to, to be with you guys today. Um, I'm, I'm very honored that the foundation is associated with this uh, book and I'm happy we're able to launch it today. I remember uh, it wasn't very long ago that we conceptualized it, just a few months, and 
the Asia Center and all the contributors have, have worked uh, very fast and very, very hard to make this happen. So uh, we wanted to get this book out uh, in 2021, simply because it's, it's 10 years after the UN guiding principles on business and human rights um, were, were drafted by the UN. And I'm glad we, we were able to, uh, to launch it uh, within this year. Uh, business and human rights obviously is a topic that is very dear to the Friedrich Naumann uh, Foundation. Uh, it's an issue that uh, we uh, work on in many, many countries. And this is the first time we've uh, been associated with a regional publication here in Southeast Asia. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, involved, obviously uh, James and Robin from the Asia Center, but also everybody who has uh, contributed uh, chapters to the book, our friends at Ideas and uh, Mr. Thomas Thomas and also Paolo at, at CALT. I also want to like to thank my colleague Jose, who's been working very hard uh, from our end to make all this happen. And uh, I, I hope um, the publication will be well received and will be useful for many people. And I would like to thank again everybody involved and wish us a great uh, launch event today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Moritz, uh, for your uh, welcome remarks. Um, before we proceed, uh, I, I will make some remarks myself, perhaps. Um, Moritz, if you wouldn't mind, and Paolo and um, Tricia, uh, and other speakers who may be here, perhaps we could take a quick uh, photo uh, of, of you. I know you have to depart, Moritz. So, uh, Please put on your best smile. And there is Vicky. Great to have you, Vicky. Uh, lovely to see you. Uh, maybe we could uh, a, a gallery view. Yes, there we go. All right. Very good. Uh, so th this is for the speakers. Okay. One, two, cheese. One more, please. Uh, three, two, one, snapshot. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, very you, much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be around for an hour or so. Uh, okay, I look very good. To the uh, to the event. Very good, very good. Thank you, Moritz. So, without further ado, perhaps let me just make also a follow in in uh, Moritz's footsteps and make just a few brief uh, uh, welcome remarks. We also wish to, we would like to thank uh, the Friedrich Norman Stiftung for their uh, partnership on this uh, project, on this book project. And also we welcome their support, their strong support. Uh, we have had a strong collaboration with the FNF uh, in the, in, you know, over the years. And we look forward to continued such collaboration on this important issue, as well as the many other human rights uh, issues that uh, are uh, present in the region. So thank you very much. And thank you, of course, to all of our uh, contributors from Ideas in Malaysia, and of course, from CALD uh, in, in the Philippines. Um, the, the partnership uh, with our colleagues, and in particular with the Friedrich Naumann uh, Foundation, uh, testifies to the importance of this topic and our own uh, mutual engagement uh, on this uh, particularly important issue. Uh, Asia Center has been doing some uh, research and advocacy in this area for some time now. And again, we are very pleased uh, that we can partner in this initiative with uh, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. There is great interest in business and human rights uh, in the region. And so, uh, <laughs> Again, we look forward to uh, uh, taking this forward. And so this event, uh, the two panels, uh, panel one and panel two in the afternoon, panel one in the morning and two in the afternoon, these events uh, seek to provide an update. What is the state of uh, BHR in the region? And what is the um, state of the development of national action plans uh, in the region? So as we proceed, I th we, th we thought we would uh, 
share a, a poll with you. We'll, I invite you to uh, engage the, uh, the participants uh, here to engage in a first poll with us. Uh, to what degree do you think that national action plans on human rights can contribute to upholding existing laws on human rights in the region? And so you have the choices between high, medium, low, or zero. So we will come back to that, the poll results in a moment. Okay, um, let's proceed uh, in the following way. Let me now provide you uh, with a uh, brief overview of the book uh, on business and human rights developing NAPs in Southeast Asia. So uh, let's move forward to the uh, key points of this, uh, of this uh, report. So we can look at the poll later uh, and perhaps, yes. So um, let me just briefly uh, point out the key developments, uh, the key points of this book. And of course, uh, I will just give you the top line uh, key points uh, and the authors themselves will outline their, their contributions uh, in the discussion that will follow, that will be moderated by Trisha Yeo from the Institute for Democracy and Economic uh, Affairs. So first of all, top line, first point, is that an initial grudging uptake by states has engendered a cascade in slow moving NAP developing processes. So basically, this speaks to the normative um, uptake, the normative side of the uptake uh, in NAPS. The BHR agenda was, in some ways, in, in, in officially kickstarted with the adoption uh, uh, 10 years ago of the UN guiding principles over the United Nations and the Human Rights Council. And since then, in this region, uh, there has been an uptake, albeit slow slow moving, but there has been an uptake nevertheless. And so the key point to note here is um, like for the whole human rights agenda from 1948 onwards until today, uh, there has been a cascade, uh, however long it, it will take, but it is progressing. And that's uh, one thing to note. Uh, the slow moving NAP development process. There is um, a movement in the region, the second point here, towards adopting NAPs. And so following Thailand's lead in adopting a NAP in December of 2019, others are poised to do the same, notably in Indonesia and Malaysia and others perhaps, but uh, I will come to that in a second. Uh, though efforts have been delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic and political uncertainty uh, in some parts. Uh, which are the others? Um, perhaps in the Philippines, perhaps in Vietnam, and Myanmar, as we know, uh, is in uh, significant uh, difficulties at the moment. And I'm sure, uh, uh, our colleague uh, and speaker for the first panel, uh, Vicky Bowman, uh, based in Myanmar, will surely uh, update us on what is the situation in Myanmar in relation to NAPS uh, while she delivers her talk. So Thailand has taken the lead in adopting this NAP and Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, as far as we understand, are on the verge of um, delivering whether it's a NAP or some kind of strategy uh, on business and human rights for their national uh, jurisdictions. So that's the second point to note. The third point is that while NHRIs, national human rights institutions and CSOs had initially taken the lead in pushing for NAPs on business and human rights, um, again, not again, I'm sorry, buttressed by the earlier adoption of NAPs in other parts of the world, Southeast Asian uh, states have began to consider NAPs processes within the past few years. And again, we come back to Thailand. Please uh, go back. Southeast Asian nations have began to consider NAPs processes within the past few years. So um, this links up with the second point there. Um, 
I wanted to, to note uh, here the point that yes, states have begun to consider NAPs, but it's important to note the, uh, the, the nudging, the pushing by national human rights commissions and civil society organizations who have um, in some cases developed guidelines, developed draft NAPs for consideration, conducted baseline studies uh, to inform uh, the, the, the NAP building process as places like Indonesia and Malaysia and hopefully the Philippines uh, and maybe down the road, maybe down the road, uh, Vietnam uh, might engage in a similar uh, conduct of baseline studies and similar NAPS processes. So moving forward to our next point, we see uh, that key stakeholders ha have been largely absent from NAPS development processes across the region. NAPS development is, according to the UN guiding uh, principles, uh, supposed to be a, an inclusive process where all stakeholders are consulted. That is the function, for example, of the baseline studies that the, the governments uh, are supposed to uh, arrange and engage in. And some key stakeholders have been absent from this process. Parliamentarians, uh, are, will um, Paolo Zamora will be elaborating on that later. Parliamentarians um, have been less engaged, if not uh, totally absent, due significantly to the lack of awareness of the BHR agenda and non-participation in executive-led processes. So I will say, uh, not say much about that, but that is something to note, uh, we note in the report, and Paolo will elaborate on that. And business organizations, due to lack of interest in an understanding of the BHR agenda, have also uh, not engaged significantly with the processes, the various processes of drafting, elaborating uh, on NAPs. Is that because they are uh, not interested as, as we suggest here, or is it because they are not aware uh, of the uh, BHR, uh, the UN guiding principles, or what is the reason? Uh, these will be elaborated upon in the afternoon session uh, by uh, Mr. Thomas Thomas uh, in the second uh, panel this afternoon. And finally, a key challenge to NAPS development processes is their alignment with international human rights standards. This is one of the key challenges in NAPS um, globally and certainly in the region. Uh, the NAPS tend to use uh, very soft languages, language, sorry, uh, weak and soft language in, re in relation to adhering to international hum human rights standards. Uh, in relation to business organizations in particular, uh, NAPS uh, need to perhaps adopt stronger language uh, rather than merely language suggesting, uh, for example, words like should, they ought to, they should study, they should review, uh, and so on, right? And I, the last thing I will note in ending this uh, overview of some of the key points is that um, on this point of alignment with human rights standards, um, the Thai NAP, for example, as good and as progressive as it is, uh, the, the benchmarks that are indicated in the Thai NAP, for example, are in relation to uh, the national human rights strategies of Thailand, but also sustainable development goals. Okay, and the sustainable development goals are very important. They aim at human rights standards, but however, uh, they are not uh, necessarily termed, phrased in human rights language. So let me uh, um, pause there. Those are some key points of our uh, report. Let me turn quickly before we come to uh, the substance of our discussion with, uh, of panel one. Uh, let me just mention briefly the poll re re uh, results. The question was, to what degree do you think that national action plans on human rights can contribute to upholding existing laws on human rights in the region? Uh, high 
28% of you uh, said high, 47% uh, of you suggested medium, 22% uh, of you suggested low, and I think that is 3% of you uh, indicate uh, zero. So uh, those are your views uh, uh, in relation to this first poll. So without further ado, let me now turn the floor over to uh, Tricia Yeo, who is CEO of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs uh, in, over in Malaysia. Uh, Tricia will now moderate this first panel on the state of NAP development in Southeast Asia. So Tricia, uh, please, the, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Robin. So uh, on my part, uh, very good morning to Dr. Robin Ramcharan, Executive Director of the Asia Centre, as well as uh, James Gomez, uh, old friend also from the Asia Centre, uh, to Moritz Hannah Brockhoff from Friedrich Naumann Foundation in Bangkok, um, and friends and panelists for this first session. So uh, as introduced, and thank you very much for the introduction, I am Trisha Yeo. I am CEO of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs based here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I'm uh, firstly wanting to say congratulations to the Asia Center for producing this very important book. Uh, the issue of business and human rights is, uh, has become increasingly important as the world talks about you know, ESG and uh, all, all the other um, requirements and expectations that businesses uh, are required to, to undertake. So um, I also would like to thank the Asia Center for including ideas. So we've contributed one chapter uh, in that book and I'm very pleased to be part of this conversation. Um, so with that, I won't take too much longer now. I just want to introduce the three speakers who have agreed to join us this morning. Um, first, we have Paolo Zamora, who is the program manager of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats, called. Uh, Paolo is here. Yes, Paolo is there. Hello, Paolo. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, our second speaker will be Vicky Bowman, who is the head of the Myanmar Center for Responsible Business. Uh, Vicky is also here. Hi, good morning. And uh, last but not least, we have Obiora Okafor, or we uh, call him Obi, who is the UN Independent Expert on Human Rights and International Solidarity, uh, who will be able to give us an international perspective. So we will go in that order. Uh, we will have eight to 10 minutes for each of the speakers to present their views. Uh, please give your brief reactions to the report. Um, I believe the, the link is already provided for everyone in the chat below. And then um, you can react to it based on your particular area of work or expertise. And I will prompt you uh, when you're coming to about eight minutes of your presentation. Uh, following that, as usual, we will have a discussion with members of the audience. And um, if any of you have questions, please place them in uh, the chat box below. And anyway, I'll be around to moderate that. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to pass the time now to Paolo. Uh, Paolo, I believe you have some slides. So uh, remember eight to 10 minutes, not too long. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Trisha. Let me just share my screen. Okay. okay, can you see my screen? And can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Paolo Zamora, Program One Manager of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats, or CALG, and a co-author of the chapter on this, uh, on the role of parliamentarians uh, in the enforcement of NAPs on business and human rights. I work on this together with uh, uh, Congressman Francis Abaya, Secretary General of CALD, who unfortunately cannot join us today because he's currently campaigning in his hometown. Uh, this chapter discusses the parliamentarian's role or the absence of it in the process. Uh, I will not go into details, but let, let me, uh, I will first briefly present to you the comparative analysis of uh, NAP development updates in Burma or Myanmar, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Viet and Vietnam, uh, which are countries in Southeast Asia with previous and ongoing initiatives on the NAP. 
We will also explore the role of parliamentarians uh, and how they could help in the process and the next steps forward in, in, in terms of integrating their participation. Uh, here's a matrix of, of the countries I mentioned where we associated status levels in terms of their NAP development process. So level one are countries with NAP. Uh, Paolo, sorry to interrupt, but your yes. slides um, are, are not very clear. So I'm not sure why the text is a little bit... Uh, because I think that the text is quite small for oh, this. Okay. Is okay. it? Uh, but it's, it's not very readable, actually. Okay, I'm not sure how to fix that. Uh, oh, can you, send, you can send the slide to me. I can share it for you. Okay, do we have time for that? Um, oh, might just ca carry on, I think. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is the next slide readable? Uh, it is, but it's also truncated, so it's cut oh, off one okay. side. I don't know what. I don't know how to fix it at the moment. Okay. It's okay, Paolo. Maybe okay, please, please, please just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we get we get the idea. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Tricia. Um, so let, as I mentioned, level one would refer to the country with a nap. And we have only one for that. Uh, level two would be the countries with commitments to draft an app. And uh, level three would be the countries with an app rela with NAP related initiatives, but no commitments to draft an app. So as you can see, only Thailand had, ha has a standalone app so far. Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam expressed commitments to draft an app, while Myanmar and Philippines have made no commitments at all. Um, there are stake, there are of course stakeholders in both countries, Myanmar and Philippines, who have been organizing several awareness building events and uh, publishing policy reports to keep the discussions going. With the NAP being a state policy, the NAP development process in these countries is mainly executive driven, as we all know, spearheaded mostly by government ministries. In Thailand, for example, the first country in Asia to have a standalone NAP. Uh, the responsibility was delegated to the Department of Rights and Liberties Protection of the Ministry of Justice. Likewise, in, in Vietnam, we have the Ministry of Justice uh, that will take a lead, the lead. Uh, in Malaysia, it was delegated to the Legal, Legal Affairs Division of the Prime Minister's Department. What is clear in this development developments is the absence of uh, parliamentarians' participation. But, but uh, it can be argued that of course, it is only natural for the executive to be the focal point in, in drafting the NAP. Uh, but according to the UN Working Group, they consider four essential criteria to be indispensable to achieve effective NAPs. And, and uh, parliamentary participation could definitely be instrumental in, in achieving this. One of the elements to achieve the full impact of the NAP is to have inclusive and transparent process as earlier pointed out by Dr. Robin. The role of parliamentarians could be crucial in this respect, according to the members actually of the UN Working Group who visited uh, Thailand to discuss and provide feedback on their draft. Uh, getting the process right is critical. Uh, these are some of the feedback we received from um, MPs we've coordinated with. Uh, if, if you can't read them, I, I, I'll read it for you. I have never come across this topic in, par in Parliament. No briefing in Parliament, no bills drafted, uh, specifically focused on NAP on business and human rights. Um, in fact, during the first few interviews we've conducted, when we asked uh, UNDP representatives and civil society organizations working on business and human rights in the region, they also informed us, and they were quite straightforward about it, that there have been no formal or informal engagements with members of parliament. In the Philippines House of Rep in the Philippine House of Representatives, while House committees are in place to tackle issues on business and human right, uh, in business, trade, and industries. No calls have been made specifically, specifically to focus on DHR. Some parliamentarians in the Philippines have attended uh, discussions organized by CHR or the Commission on Human Rights, but they participated in their own individual capacities. This is also the same situation in, in the same situation in Indonesia. 
where you can really determine, where you really can't determine the level of participation of parliamentarians because it was not really done in a structured way. The only coordination they had with Congress was when they received an invitation from the House Committee on Trade and Industry to submit a position paper on proposed amendments in the Corporation Code of the Philippines. The intention, of course, is to amend a 38-year-old law to improve the ease of doing business in the country. Uh, so CHR submitted their proposed amendments, uh, putting specifically um, highlighting uh, corporate responsibility to respect human rights and the human rights due diligence as their recommendations. But the House bill seeking to amend the, cons the corporate code was when it's enacted um, without the recommendations of CHR being adopted. Malaysia has done significant strides in business and human rights as both government and businesses understood the win-win solution in promoting its clean and green supply chains to global standards. According to Professor Aisha Bidin, former Suhakam um, Commissioner or the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia and presently an advisor to the Legal Affairs Division of the ministry in charge on in the NAT process, they want to formal, the finalize the national baseline this year so they could uh, release the zero draft by 2022. Malaysia still aims to launch its SNAP on DHR by 2023. Um, but still, uh, business and human rights dis discussions in parliament remains to be seen. But according to um, Wong Chen, a uh, member of parliament from the People's Justice Party, there is very li limited capacity for parliament to get involved and only uh, the law minister has the data and resources to lead the NAP consultation and draft process. In Thailand, despite having uh, a, an official standalone NAP uh, and already in the implementation stage, and uh, the awareness of politicians is still limited. According to Kun Kiat Sityamon, a member of parliament from the Democrat Party of Thailand, the distinction between the NAP and the Labor Code Act is unclear as all principles of the NAP have already been included in the said law. He also mentioned that in terms of other parliamentary intervention, for example, there was a, 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 an intention in the sub Senate Subcommittee on Human Rights uh, led by Kun Suwapan to include business and human rights discussions, but it has yet to be tabled. So uh, let's go to the substance of the chapter. Uh, the missing role of parliamentarians shaped some of uh, some form of curiosity from the MPs we've been getting if we've contact contacted. The opportunity to explore business and human rights formed realizations that could open doors of opportunities to further promote and deepen the understanding of the topic. Organizations such as UNDP, which has a B plus HR program and has been promoting responsible business practices. Um, also recognized that the exclusion of parliamentarians was an oversight and expressed how important parliamentary engagements could be across different stages of the NAP development process. So how can parliamentar parliamentarians help in the process? Uh, first, they could provide checks and balances to, to the executive branch with the NAP functioning as one of the indicators <clears throat> of, the con of the conduct and performance of the government relating to human rights. This is important as it provides uh, transparency in the process and could aid in the review of the, the NAP, which are vital elements, as mentioned earlier, in the U UN guiding principles in drafting a NAP. Uh, parliamentarians can also provide more inclusive channels to promote uh, business and human rights through House committees. Uh, according to Congressman Keith Belmonte from the Liberal Party of the Philippines, Members of Congress can reflect on future legislative actions that will help fulfill state obligations in line with international human rights uh, instruments and treaties that the country is a party to. Um, parliamentarians, lastly, could also provide a deeper understanding of business, human, business and human rights among colleagues in parliament and their constituents. Uh, members of parliament would be able to invite experts in the field 
to share previous initiatives and updates, clarify concerns and issues, and strengthen the synergy between the two uh, institutions, the executive and the legislative, together with other stakeholders. Um, keeping the parliament in the discussion or in the loop could help address the challenges initially encountered by the executive in the NAP process. Members of parliament who responded to our inquiries recommended possible next steps in their respective countries. In Malaysia, uh, Wong Chen said, suggested to create pressure on the Malaysian law minister by periodically questioning the progress of the NAP. Um, however, he also thinks that uh, the changing business environment and the consumer demands might be a bigger influence to fast track the, the ministry to act. Um, in the Philippines, uh, Congressman Kit Belmonte suggested to review the current status of business sector operations in relation to its adherence to human rights. Congressman Belmonte also suggested the creation of infor, um, information and education mechanisms and launch a multi-sectoral, a multi-level support advocacy that could cater to different sectors involved. Um, Congressman Francis Blue Abaya, who is, who is my co-author in the chapter, uh, suggested to provide uh, parliamentar parliamentarians the reports and, uh, and updates of executive decisions concerning business and human rights and, and um, invite representatives of government, ministries, and departments in charge of business and human rights to have a dialogue in, in, in the parliament <clears throat> for future coordination. In Thailand, um, again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Kunkiat Sityamon uh, suggested to provide clarity on the compliance of the Thai Labor Protection Act to the NAP. He also su suggested that a review of the uh, feedback and recommendations after implementing the NAP is also necessary. Uh, I believe this is vital in Thailand as the Ministry of Justice is currently in the monitoring and implementation stage and is scheduled to update and draft a new NAP by next year, by 2022. The experiences of uh, Southeast Asian countries in the development of NAP shows that the process must be understood in the political context. In all countries included in this country, with the exception of, of uh, <clears throat> the Philippines, the engagement of parliamentarians in developing NAP, the NAP was noticeably um, missing. Upon reviewing the development of countries included in this chapter, we think that parliamentarians can significantly, con significantly contribute to the following stages in the NAP process. In the pre-drafting stage, we think that parliamentarians can generate pressure on the executive to start the drafting of the NAP by expressing support in parliament, in media, or in other public events. This could also provide uh, the public uh, information on what business and human rights is and create attention or enough publicity that could speed up the process. Um, in the drafting stage, uh, in this stage, parliamentarians could help in ensuring policy coherence, especially since some of the country's legislation may need to be revised uh, or amended as they can be aligned um, with the UN, UNGP commitments or the guiding principles. This is one of the realizations of Thailand at the moment. Oh, there are, sorry, if you can wrap up as well soon. Yeah, thank but, you. Uh, this is one of the realizations of Thailand as the mo at the moment because they can see they, there are inconsistent or outdated laws vis-a-vis -vis business and human rights. Another example is the bis uh, omnibus law in, Tha in Indonesia um, which received uh, criticisms on restricting labor rights <clears throat> and environment and dismantling the environmental protections. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the last stage, the implementation review stage, through parliamentary committees, the parli parliamentarians can assist in monitoring compliance with the NAP. And it could also spur public debate and push the government to comply with their commitments. So let me end by saying that uh, business and human rights is not a race, but a process. This is a, a short but 
enlightening or should I say comforting reminder from my co-panelist who is here, Ms. Vicky Bauman, when we get to talk to her previously uh, on the status of Myanmar. Um, but, but this chapter definitely is still a work in pro progress and much work needs to be done. Uh, but to acknowledge the absence of the role of parliamentarians in the NAP process is an important first step to further elevate, elevate the understanding on business and human rights and strengthen the initiatives of stakeholders who in the past 10 years have been championing the, uh, championing the quest to protect and respect human rights and secure remedies to business-related impacts. So I guess I'll end there and uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer your questions later. Thank you so much, Paolo. Um, that was really quite a, a good summary of uh, what you wrote in the chapter. Um, so we'll get to you later. But there are some questions that are trickling in already. Uh, just to respond to the immediately to the question that somebody's just posed on why Singapore was not mentioned. Um, I believe it's because there are no NAP process that has been reported. So there's no any NAP or NAP process that has been reported for Singapore itself. Uh, so that I hope that answers the question. But um, I think Paolo's presentation essentially tells us that parliamentarians uh, must be included in the, in the political process towards drafting of these NAPs. And essentially, um, I mean, if they are there in the process of, of crafting and drafting, uh, that also means that they would essentially be there to place greater pressure uh, on the government. So whether, I mean, I, I suppose like my questions would be like, which MPs actually matter more? You know, is it uh, the backbenchers or are we talking about the opposition MPs? Um, and I guess the other question would be like, whether upper houses make a difference as well, right? Like does the Senate contribute any role? Uh, and is it not just like members of parliament? Um, okay, but we'll come back to you later. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Vicky Bowman. Uh, so Vicky, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, the question about Singapore was one I was going to cover um, also in my, uh, it was going to be my final point, uh, but I'll come back to it. So um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and also for uh, publishing this very interesting report. Myanmar Centre for Responsible Business, which is based in Yangon, has been operating since 2013. So it's been over eight years. And we've been funded by uh, six different European governments, um, I think all of which now have, have NAPs themselves. And indeed MCRB and their support for it is mentioned in some of, some of their NAPs. And we've always been established to work on the UN guiding principles. That's been our kind of our guiding light um, throughout our, our work here, but also, other international standards and as you're all aware the guiding principles have been integrated into many of those um, international standards from the OECD, uh, the IFC and so on. Um, perhaps to start off with I just want to say a little bit about the the Myanmar NAP history or the mythical Myanmar NAP because there was never actually any Myanmar government office holder uh, who committed to drawing up a national action plan what happened was back in um, 2015, February, there was a, um, an ASEAN CSR forum, I think, in Bali, where Professor Anton Thet, who is, was chair of the UN Global Compact Local Network, um, expressed support for there being a uh, national action plan. And given that he wore many hats, including as economic advisor to the then president, and he went on to become um, an advisor to the, the subsequent NLD government led by Aung San Suu Kyi, I think there was a sort of perception that he was speaking on behalf of government, but really that wasn't the case. It was much more his own enthusiasm for the topic of business and human rights that was leading him to say that and encourage um, uh, Myanmar down that route. And indeed, um, the comment about this being um, a process rather than a race was somewhat my um, concern that there was a desire to rush this and produce a piece of paper, um, you know, and call it a nap and say we're the first, and even to beat, you know, what turned out to be Thailand in, in the first, um, and that that would override the whole value of, of a nap. But from the government side, there was no interest or interaction, but there was plenty of um, encouragement from 
UNDP and then subsequently the OECD when they did their investment policy review. Um, looking at it standing um, where I was, it seemed to me sometimes this was more focused on a tick in the box of a, a you know a donor program log frame than it was really a reflection of whether Myanmar was actually ready in its institutional um, capabilities to embark on, on a NAP. Um, and the other thing I observed also was these two institutions, the UNDP and OECD, were um, somewhat causing confusion within government in that um, the UN was calling for a NAP on business and human rights, whereas the OECD was referring to a, a national action plan on responsible business conduct. And I often found myself saying both to them and to the government, the Myanmar government, in, in all, um, in effect, these are the same thing. It's not two different national action plans. And even then, um, on understanding this was just one thing, the government's reaction, and this was from the more progressive members of the government, were was, OK, but this is not our priority right now. We have so many other things that we're trying to do around implementation of new laws on companies law, investment law environmental impact assessment and, and so on. So, so there was, there was a, a bureaucratic reluctance, which I think was more a, a realistic view of what priorities were um, from the government prior to the coup. Now, after the 1st of February coup, obviously everything changes. Uh, first of all, there is um, zero support to the government from development partners. Um, so those pressures from outside fall away. Uh, secondly, the military government has um, many things on its plate, most of them um, self-created uh, self, uh, problems, and human rights is clearly not um, a top priority. Um, so it means that any talk of NAPS, I think, is completely pointless for the, for the present situation. And of course, we have no elected parliament anymore. So therefore, um, the, any discussion of a parliamentary role, at least in terms of uh, you know, parliaments sitting in Napidor is not relevant because they're not there. There are, of course, parliamentarians who are out, um, many of them uh, in, in detention, also uh, in the jungle and, and in exile. Um, so parliamentarians have been very much under, uh, under um, pressure and uh, um, abuse, had their rights abused since, since the coup. However, just because a NAP isn't being discussed, it's not to say that the UN guiding principles aren't relevant, far from it, they are even more relevant. And most of my time over the last 10 months has been uh, spent on discussing the question of uh, how companies should undertake heightened human rights due diligence in the current situation. And the heightened concept comes in because we are in a situation where the entire country is conflict affected and high risk. And therefore, when undertaking human rights due diligence, businesses should be looking at um, a conflict analysis, an analysis of the impacts of their business on that conflict, and an analysis of the impacts of that conflict on their business operations and the human rights risks. And um, we were speaking about that yesterday in a seminar um, organized by UNDP with some hundred Myanmar and foreign companies. We've been speaking to Japanese companies who are showing a great deal of interest in it. And in particular, discussing some of the new um, risks which were not really present pre-coup, such as how businesses respect their employees' right to freedom of expression. If their employees want to go out and demonstrate, or if they want the um, the company to close down, uh, as, as happened last week on, on Friday the 10th, when the entire country closed down as an expression of defiance against the military regime, how should businesses respond to that in a way which respects human rights? The other um, new area of risk is around safety linked to public security presence. Um, we have many soldiers and police and others on the street, and this impacts on businesses because it's impacting on their workers who are going to and from work, the workers in their, in their private time as well. So how should um, businesses be helping to keep their, their workers safe in these um, conditions? And then another new area of risks, or at least a, a, a heightened area of risk relates to the devaluation of the currency, the chat, which is devalued by about 
40 uh, percent since uh, since the 1st of February. Um, so what impact is that having on uh, fair working conditions and uh, living standards? What does that mean for, for businesses, particularly in um, uh, companies and sectors like the cut, make, pack garment sector, where Myanmar's minimum wage in dollar terms is now one third of what it is in Cambodia and Cambodia's minimum wage is hardly generous. So all of these are the sort of issues that companies should be considering um, in the context of heightened human rights due diligence, which should be an ongoing process because these things change from, from day to day. Uh, and what we're encouraging them to do is as much as possible to work on these things sectorally with other companies. There is no point in every uh, company in the garment sector or the logistics sector or the beverage sector in doing their own conflict analysis. Uh, these are largely things which can be done collectively, but at the individual company level, they do need to do their human rights due diligence and work out how they are going to prevent, mitigate uh, risks and so on. And then they need to be tracking and reporting on it. And the knowing and showing is something we've been emphasizing, the showing. Uh, we've been advising companies to use the Global Reporting Initiative's uh, standard number three as a means of structuring how they show um, what they're doing. Um, and we believe that if they follow through on this, this will certainly help increase the visibility of business and human rights related to, to Myanmar and give us some good country specific um, uh, case studies and examples from, from Myanmar. So I just want to um, finish by talking a little bit about the role of NAPs from other countries on the business and human rights situation in Myanmar. Um, particularly relevant, of course, where countries do have NAPs. Uh, so Thailand is the one that's being mentioned most in this, um, in this session, but also Japan adopted a NAP uh, back in, I think it was October 2020. And mentioned in the report also was the Chinese Human Rights Action Plan, uh, which I'm going to look more into because obviously Ch Thailand, Ch Japan and China are very significant um, uh, investors and business partners with Myanmar. What we've seen from the Japanese action plan, although I wouldn't say it's a particularly um, uh, strong document, I think the Thai one is, is better, but it has helped to unblock um, the sort of reluctance to talk about business and human rights uh, that we saw, for example, in embassies and to some extent companies. It's been helpful in making companies more com comfortable with the concept. Um, what we see with Japanese companies is, is that more and more of them now have human rights policies. Uh, so they're starting down that track. And these policies are usually obviously at headquarters level in, in Tokyo or, or elsewhere. But um, very few of them have start, have been visibly doing human rights due diligence. But there are some, and that includes some Japanese companies who are involved in Myanmar. So, for example, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a Japanese company who had started to embark on a real estate development project. And they were undertaking uh, due diligence um, as to what they should continue to do. And that involved seeking the views of workers, not just from their own company, but also from the various subcontractors that they were working with. Uh, we managed after 1st of February to get 30 companies signed up to a, a, a statement of concern about the coup. That was together with another 200 Myanmar and, and other foreign companies. Um, and the Japanese government has, or the, the Japanese embassy in Myanmar has also uh, retained a law firm, a Japanese law firm to write a guide on uh, heightened human rights due diligence for, for companies. So I think these are all positive um, steps that will help to raise awareness amongst uh, Japanese um, uh, investors. What uh, we were hearing yesterday from one of the lawyers that works on this is that there are still problems of understanding of what human rights due diligence is because the term due diligence is generally associated with a very um, paper-based legal process. And the Japanese companies are still quite reluctant to engage with NGOs and other stakeholders and can often feel under siege and tend to somewhat simplify the, the debate into um, an argument of, well, are you asking us to stay or go, but surely it's better for us to stay. Whereas of course, um, what good human rights due diligence means is a consideration of how to stay or go responsibly. 
uh, and what that means. And it could mean changes to practices and, and approaches. The other um, country with the NAP, Thailand, very important. And there, interesting to see the role of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Thailand, uh, which is mentioned within the, the action plan as having a role in regulating public companies in respecting and complying with the UNGPs. I don't think that role has really been developed by the SEC, but it's important that um, the SEC or SET of, of Thailand is one of the more forward ones within the region around sustainability reporting. It's a member of the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative. Um, and within the ASEAN corporate governance uh, benchmark, Thai companies tend to, to score relatively highly compared to, to their peers in, in the region. So seeing that there's an SEC role there, I think is something to be to be built on, certainly with Thailand, but also looking at equivalents within the rest of ASEAN. Um, the other is that the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand is, is mentioned within the, um, the plan as having a role cross-border. And we had a discussion with uh, the, the Thai National Human Rights Commission a couple of weeks ago about the risks that we were seeing for businesses in Myanmar and specifically related to, to Thai businesses and the sectors in which they operate. And then finally, I want to reiterate the question that was put in the chat box, where is Singapore in this paper? Um, but where is Singapore generally? Uh, so the, um, the answer that was given just now by Tricia is uh, that they haven't expressed interest in a national action plan, but, but why not? Because when I sit in, in Yangon, there is a significant ecosystem of people I talk to on business and human rights who are actually based in Singapore. Uh, consultants, uh, the, the headquarters for you know, the Coca-Colas and, and oil companies and so on who are working on human rights and, um, and public affairs in, in the region. And then also the, the Singapore Institute of Directors, um, which is you know, quite strong on these issues around corporate governance and, and disclosure. And Singapore itself has a strong regulatory framework. It's not always embedding human rights visibly, but on issues such as governance on safety, Singapore is, if you're sitting in Myanmar, the, the local um, uh, lodestar for us and many of the Myanmar diaspora who go and work in, in Singapore in areas like safety come back and are snapped up by, by companies in Myanmar because they have been working to, to good uh, standards around these areas. So I, I do think that it's about time Singapore stepped up on this issue and it would find itself, if it were to step up, I think quite far ahead in, in the pack. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky, for your uh, very succinct, actually, and you managed to cover quite a lot uh, in, in that uh, about 15 minutes or so of, the, of your presentation. Um, so it looks like the NAP development of countries in South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and I thank you for bringing in um, other countries as well, um, which are not necessarily in Southeast Asia, but definitely within um, Asia. So Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, and then of course the last one, Singapore. It's quite checkered, right? So we still see this sort of uh, a very uh, uneven uh, development of the NAPs. Um, and of course, sharing from your perspective on the Myanmar side, uh, that of course the, the political context of Myanmar, uh, there's a, another huge added layer there which needs to be understood um, in terms of the risks and so on. Uh, so thanks for, for sharing that. Um, so as I come back to the panel, uh, our third speaker, actually, Obiora, we've been waiting for him to join, and apparently there are some technical problems. So uh, we will just wait for him. But if he's not able to join us, then we'll have a really long um, hour right now of a discussion between the panelists. And uh, I think any of you that have questions can also uh, put in the questions into the box. So um, one of the questions that was raised uh, earlier on, so there was a question here uh, about the NAP, whether it's developed at a regional level, um, and therefore, I think that that's actually two different questions. So number one, is the NAP developed at the regional level? And then secondly, um, whether this would be binding in terms of the commitment of regional state party and uh, the government? So that's one question. 
And then maybe if you might like to respond to something that I think Obiora, who would have been here, uh, would have talked about. So he was intending to offer a pretty critical perspective on the slow uptake of business and human rights by businesses in the developing world. So he obviously strongly encourages uptake of BHR by businesses. Uh, so maybe at the first round of um, Q&A and this discussion, we could get responses from both of you, Paolo and Vicky, on those two comments. Um, how would you respond to that? Like, why do you think the businesses are uh, so slow to respond and well, despite the increasing pressures as well, right, that are coming in from the international markets, say like in the, in the US, um, in, from Europe as well. I think speaking on the, from the Malaysian perspective, I know that the companies here, for example, um, are aware, are, well, perhaps not, not aware enough of it, uh, but I think there's a difference between being aware uh, and then after that, embarking on some steps to take it forward. And um, I think a third question just on my part would be, um, how do you think the pandemic over the last two years has either accelerated or uh, kind of removed em an emphasis on business and human rights? I mean, I can imagine that some companies are just merely struggling to survive, uh, much less think about how they move forward. But ironically, perhaps it is by thinking about these forward-looking steps that will allow them to propel themselves forward in the 21st century. So maybe those three things, and I'll give uh, the time to Paolo and then Vicky, and then uh, any other questions that come up, I will respond there as well. Paolo. Okay, yes, thank you for those questions. Thank you, Trisha. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, perspective from, or, or uh, the slow pace of uh, um, adoption or understanding by the businesses probably because uh, because we have different businesses we have the big ones and the small and medium enterprises for example uh, in in the in the experience of Thailand um, they had problems despite a standalone nap they had problems making them understand the the essence of of the nap. Uh, in terms during the implementation stage, because uh, the large businesses who are eager to jump in because they understand, because they have the resources, because they have to communicate to their EU trade partners that we have this, uh, uh, are going all in. Unlike unlike the small and small and medium enterprises who doesn't really have enough resources and, uh, and, and enough uh, objectives to, you know, transnationally uh, engage uh, EU, EU uh, companies, for example, they operate mainly internally. And to them, uh, it's, it's still a, a vague concept uh, of having a national, national action plan. Uh, so that's, that's one of the discrepancies. Uh, they are encountering right uh, encountering right now. It's not it's it's not a guarantee that if you have a nap, things are smooth, uh, and that's that's uh, very evident in in Thailand's case. Uh, in terms of the question of on pandemic, uh, we well Malaysia uh, through uh, doc, Professor Doctor Bidin uh, ex really expressed the difficulty of engaging with their stakeholders, especially. Um, getting getting to know the the the, the thematic high risk uh, themes that they want to focus on in 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 the process because um, it, it's it's not enough it's not enough to just talk online they need to see the people on the ground they need to see the operations that that is uh, that the companies are 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 going through. And, and also, um, they, they need to talk to, to, the, to the people experience, experiencing this uh, adverse uh, corporate impacts uh, at the moment. So, but they are, they are optimistic that despite the difficulties of the pandemic, actually, in Malaysia and in, in, in Thailand, um, they would want to include the issue of uh, the pandemic in the, in the process especially for Thailand who's up, that is update. They're updating their NAP by 2022. And in definitely the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will be included in one of us, one of their issues. Um, so I think that's, that's it for me. 
All right, thank you, Paolo. Um, Vicky, and then there was the other question about uh, the regional level and how how could like how how binding those commitments could be at the regional level. Um, oh. Vicky. Okay. Um, so I think first of all, I agree with Paolo's point that one of the main drivers for this is economic incentives on business to frame what they do and what they may need to do extra um, in business and human rights language. And mentioned in the report is the well-known case around the Thai fisheries. There's the Vietnamese free trade agreement with the EU, which has got human rights elements in, in it. Um, there's the you know, future prospect of mandatory human rights due diligence coming from European companies who will be passing that on to their supply chains in uh, things like garments, IT, and, and, and so on. So, so definitely, I think more of that will start to push this out into, into the wider Asian business uh, community. But the second thing which is also mentioned in the report is that most ASEAN businesses are SMEs. And frankly, if you go to Europe, you will find most European SMEs are not talking about business and human rights. And why should they really? I mean, it's, it's of interest to us to talk about it in this way, but they are dealing with the day-to-day -day issues of keeping their employees safe, deciding what to do during the pandemic, um, ensuring that you know, they're not um, breaching local laws on the environment. They're not seeing it in business and human rights terms, but I don't honestly think that matters very much because it is all contributing to respect for human rights if they're doing it properly. So I don't think we should get too hung up about the fact that SMEs are not really um, fully engaged in uh, these conferences. But what's more important is that these policies, these approaches shouldn't um, be have a negative effect on SMEs by, for example, requiring you know, huge reporting or assessment requirements, which they simply can't afford to do. So, so we need to take into account their, their needs, but also understand how they perceive it. And I also think partly it's that the business and human rights language is, is presented by experts in a very theoretical way. Uh, I mean, I've sat through so many of these presentations and my eyes glaze over and I'm an expert. Uh, you've really got to bring it down to the practical terms. So yesterday in the webinar I was on, I was talking about a case that we had recently in which a shopping centre had some in-house security guards who on seeing a flash mob demonstration, rather than as they had been apparently told to do, encouraging the demonstrators to make their point and then move on before the soldiers arrived, they instead ran and rugby tackled them. This was all across social media. The shopping center was socially punished, was shamed, and consequently it's still being boycotted by customers. And the tenants of the shopping center are also asking questions about security management. That is, to me, core business and human rights territory. But I haven't seen anybody apart from me talking about it as that. They are just seeing it as bad business, bad, bad management, having a, a knock-on effect on the bottom line. So we need to bring out some of these sort of examples and explain what are the human rights issues there. It's the fact that your security guards were not correctly trained in understanding freedom of expression and understanding the limitations on use of force. You know, so so these are the sort of real life examples that I think bring it to life for a, for a business. Um, then finally, I think one of the problems here is the politicized and sensitive nature of the words human rights throughout the region, which is mentioned in the report, but particularly obviously in a place like like Myanmar right now, where the military regime is looking at everybody from the perspective of uh, are you with us or against us? And equally, frankly, the you know, wider stakeholders are looking at businesses from that perspective, too. Um, so businesses reaction in that um, environment is to keep their heads down and not talk about human rights on the grounds that they will either potentially upset the military and have their managers called in, uh, which has happened, or they will upset, um, upset the, the wider population and get socially punished. So, so there's a definite sort of survival instinct by businesses, particularly the Myanmar ones, to keep their heads down on this issue. All right, thank you, Vicky. Um, I love that illustration, uh, very visual. 
And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, it, it, it can get very easy for those of us who are so used to the jargon and um, this, these words are just, we can just plot them out from, from the air and just present like a whole you know, PowerPoint presentation while forgetting that what is it we're really talking about. I mean, it is very visual. It's about the impacts that uh, any of these consequences are going to have on human lives. So I think maybe, you know, this report will probably need to be turned into a video um, for, for the businesses that are already so occupied by grappling with all of the modern day uh, challenges to be able to watch. Okay, um, so the questions are coming in fast and furious now. And I, I am also reminded that um, there's a whole bunch of questions that people had submitted even before uh, the conference itself, before the panel. So I'm going to try and combine uh, some of them in the way that I can. So uh, Cynthia Peterson is asking, is there any discussion in transnational impacts of companies in the region's NAPs as issues such as complicity are material? Um, so I suppose, yeah, the question is about transnational impact um, and complicity. And then um, a, a second question here is on by Mark Ritchie. Um, entrepreneurial government or governance is a concept, a concept in public administration. So which countries in Southeast Asia have inclinations towards this? And do you think this concept of governments would have favorable or unfavorable effects on business and human rights in our region? Um, so entrepreneurial government and governance. Um, yeah, that, that is interesting. So, I mean, I think what, what Vicky is also saying is that, like, I think the example that you cited in the previous intervention was that that example of UNDP and, and the OECD is like, you know, these international organizations can also get caught up with the terminologies, but essentially they're the same thing, right? So is it a rose by any other name? Um, and the third question from Kanya Mezariani is, um, do you think that the role of companies are higher in driving the BHR agenda in the region compared to the government? So is it, is it businesses as in companies themselves driving it or like, should it be the government? So uh, maybe with that, and then um, I think I'll, I will leave it there for now, these three questions. I'll, I'll leave both of you to answer in any way you feel fit. And then the next round of questions, actually the, the questions that were submitted prior to this, um, a lot of them have to do with Myanmar. So I think there's quite a lot of interest from the, the crowd here who are from Myanmar itself. And then later I could direct that uh, to you, Vicky. So Paolo, do you have a response to these three? Uh, I'll let Vicky uh, address the first two questions okay. first, but she's the expert here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, okay. um, so, so let me turn to, to Cynthia's question first. I mean, transnational impacts in the region's NAPs. Well, obviously, we only have the, the Thai NAP to actually see right now in terms of a, a finalized document. Uh, but yes, I mean, that does mention, as I said in my presentation, um, that the role of Thai businesses, particularly investing in neighboring countries, is something which is in scope and that both the... Um, Securities and Exchange Commission of Thailand and the Human Rights Commission should play a role in, I can't remember the exact words, but all I can remember is the Human Rights Commission telling us our powers are limited. Um, but they have been involved at least in, in one discussion uh, with um, civil society groups around the impact of um, Thai companies in Cambodia. Uh, and they did have another case brought to them, which was Myanmar related about Thai companies and the Douai Special Economic Zone. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're at the level of, uh, you know, court cases for complicity, um, but at least there is that recognition that these, um, these bodies which have been given responsibility should be looking beyond the borders at the activities of their transnational corporations. Um, the, the question about entrepreneurial government and governance I'm not sure I know exactly what that is, but I'm making the assumption again that we would be talking about things like Singapore, um, where I would say there's a very strong um, focus on ease of doing business, um, you know, and reducing regulation, reducing red tape, and so on. Um, now, as to which countries in Southeast Asia have inclinations towards this, I can tell you Myanmar has inclinations, but always manages to go backwards rather than forward on it. I mean, it's something which is very much um, 
in the uh, priorities of the Ministry of Investments and Companies administration. However, they are let down by all of the other ministries who have an extremely sort of controlling uh, red tape approach to uh, to permits, partly from a corruption perspective, partly more from a, a control perspective. So, so in Myanmar, they're, they're split, but I would say that right now the controllers are, are winning out. Does the concept of sort of ease of doing business have favourable or unfavourable effects on business and human rights? I think that's a very interesting question because it depends on whether it leads to laws which are actually good but easier for businesses to comply with um, because it's it's easy to come out with some law that looks marvelous on paper about you know um, tying the hands of business and preventing them from doing x y and z uh, but it's either actually impossible to comply with for, for multiple reasons or is not enforced um, whereas a law which is less restrictive but nonetheless effectively implemented uh, without co corruption, etc., may have ultimately a, a stronger um, impact on on protecting human rights. So, so for me, it's always about in the end effective enforcement, effective laws. And I didn't say this in my original comments, but the the lawmaking process in Myanmar has so far to go um, in its um, uh, effectiveness, cons consistency, consultation, and this is at all levels from the drafters within government, um, the, the non-existent role of the Human Rights Commission in advising on human rights um, elements of those draft laws, and then the Parliament's inability to either interject human rights into those laws or make them more effective. So um, one of our greatest problems in protection of human rights in Myanmar has been very poor quality laws, particularly in the in the land field, but also more widely. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, Paolo, do you want to respond to that third question about business and government? Like, you know, who, who is actually the more effective stakeholder in this regard? That's right. I, I, I think it's it's uh, it's difficult to say that they have the higher ground in terms of pushing for naps nap process. Who, who is the day that you're referring to, Paolo? Uh, this companies, businesses, okay. Okay. because I think they work hand in hand with advocacy groups together with the uh, human rights uh, institutes as well. Um, uh, they are collectively pushing forward the process. Uh, but what is critical in, in, in the process is, of course, the political will of the government. Without it, even if you keep engaging it, uh, nothing will happen, uh, as in the case of uh, Myanmar. It's also in the Philippines. We have so much recommendations uh, in the Philippines. Uh, the initial uh, concept to have a, 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 the first snap of the in the region is supposed to be here in the Philippines. But given the the perspective of the current government uh, and the precedent on human rights, it's difficult to push that. Uh, this is also the same with, um, well, in Indonesia, there are, there are really uh, significant gains in terms of this respect. But, but uh, up until now, the uh, President Jokowi, I think, has not even uh, signed the updated uh, human rights agenda mm. uh, as we speak. So it's, it's a very, very crucial balance, but, but uh, both, both businesses uh, and advocacy groups and the government have very crucial participation in the process. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, I see your hand up as well, Vicky. Yes, I, I just wanted to add something, um, an example um, for the third question. I would certainly say that um, companies and particularly international companies have a much greater role in Myanmar um, in driving human rights protection. Uh, and I want to give the example around Telenor and the telecom sector in Myanmar. So, when Telenor first came into Myanmar as one of what became four operators in the mobile phone sector, they did their human rights impact assessments. Their highest risk that they identified was that the telecoms legislation had no safeguards related to surveillance or what's called lawful interception. So nothing around um, the need for you know, a, a court order, limitations on, on who could have access, et cetera, nothing in there at all. It basically just was very open to, you know, if the government wants data, it will get it. So um, they saw this as their biggest risk. 
Um, and together with, with them and with others over the coming years between 2014 and 2020, we did our best to try to advocate for legal safeguards to be brought in. And this involved um, doing advocacy towards the parliament, um, both pre and post 2015 election. It involved advocacy towards the National Human Rights Commission. Um, and what we were trying to explain is that the current legal framework prevents this company from respecting human rights because it basically gives an open door to government to demand data. I found that government stakeholders, um, most of them with a, one or two notable exceptions, did not understand that. Um, parliamentary stakeholders totally did not understand that. And perhaps worst of all, the National Human Rights Commission did not understand that. They could not grasp that their law undermined a company's um, ability to respect human rights. Mm. And we know the end of this story, which was eventually in 2020 under the NLD government, um, Telenor were told you need to switch on the interception equipment. So this was pre-coup. And then obviously post-coup, even more pressure and, and more risk for, for Telenor, which ultimately led to them deciding to sell, sell out. So what we have found is, you know, a effectively a responsible company seeking to do the right thing, seeking to respect human rights, has been forced out by the act of government or the emissions of, of government. Um, so that's just one e example, but there are others, but perhaps that is the most um, uh, obvious and what's ironic now is that within the ministry, um, people who don't want them to leave are saying, oh, can we put together those safeguards you gave us you know, three or four years ago in draft? You know, could we get those out quickly? Would you stay if we did? Well, a bit late now, sadly. Yes, thank you. That, that's, that's also remarkable. I mean, I think yeah, it also reminds me of the, the legal framework and the regulatory framework just within Malaysia itself, right? So you're right. I mean, sometimes it is the multinationals that um, that are thinking about how their reporting would be back to the HQ, for example, or perhaps um, activists that will, will flag this up as their behavior in other countries. So maybe in Malaysia or in Myanmar itself, uh, the local scene may not react so much, but how does this look like for uh, the other countries within which they operate or the HQs within which they operate? Um, so ultimately, it is really about the legal framework and, uh, and the political will, I think is also what you said, right, Paolo? Um, okay, so I'm going to have specific uh, questions now addressed to each of you. Um, so these are not within the chat, uh, these were just submitted earlier. So to, to you, Paolo, since you were uh, responsible for the chapter on the parliamentarians. So first, um, why have parliamentarians not been involved in drafting NAPs? Uh, or rather, perhaps, uh, from what I understand from your presentation, not as involved, right? Um, are they not supposed to provide a check and balance on the executive? Um, a related question is, what parliamentary mechanisms can MPs use to exert legislative power over the drafting of NAPs? Um, so, yeah, can they? I mean, are there any parliamentary mechanisms, at, if at all? So that's to you, Paolo. Um, to Vicky... Uh, so this one's about Myanmar. So uh, this person's requesting an update about corporate complicity in Myanmar, especially in the oil and gas sector. Uh, I'm also interested in this question because, um, you know, Ideas has done some work on oil and gas transparency in the past. And I know that Petronas operates in Myanmar. So I'm very interested as well like, to know what kind of responsibility, um, corporate responsibility it is that they have been complying to, if at all. Um, and then, uh, so again on Myanmar, so yeah, I think this person is asking, uh, how does ASEAN address this, if at all? So address, I think what the person is saying, the, the, how does ASEAN address the Myanmar question? Um, and then maybe since the term ASEAN was mentioned, um, where does ASEAN fit in with this whole conversation of business and human rights? I mean, you know, are they, I'm sure they have something, but whether or not they are empowered to, to, towards compliance of countries, I think it's a, it's a different, it's a different level altogether. Um, and then I will leave the last few questions for the last segment. Uh, so for this one, maybe Paolo first. 
Uh, yeah, uh, to answer you directly, because it's not part of their radar, uh, none actually engaged. Some of, uh, there are no engagements in parliament, nor engagements in house committees. Probably it's relative uh, in terms of, uh, you know, which countries you're referring to. But, but uh, based on the feedback we received from our correspondences, um, they haven't even, they, some of them had to um, ask the ministries involved what business and human rights is. Um, it, it, it's to that level, no, no exposure and no awareness at all. Uh, and this is also acknowledged by, by some of the or organizations we've engaged with. Um, as uh, referring to your question on which mechanism probably in, in legislature could help, I think the House committees could be a big help in providing, in informing um, um, concepts and, and, and promoting the, the, the substance and the, the information about business and human rights, because this is where they could provide uh, legislative actions and also um, they could integrate um, uh, the business human rights concept in, in international human rights instruments that the countries they're, they're serving is uh, an instrument, is a party to. Um, the, the only problem with some of the countries is they kept saying that uh, the business and human rights, similar concepts to that, are already embedded in the human rights um, agenda of similar situation here in the Philippines. They wouldn't want to have a separate nap because of that concept. And, and uh, advocacy groups led by the Commission on Human Rights, for example, here in our country, has been pushing for, for an understanding that it, 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 it has a different benefit other than just providing a chapter. Uh, this, again, promoting economic uh, incentives uh, in case we, we have a stand standalone nap. So I, I think house committees would be a very good channel for business and human rights to, to enter into the consciousness of the parliamentarians. All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Paolo. Uh, Vicky, do you have any, uh, just any reactions to that or you can go ahead to answer the other? Sure. Uh, I mean, on, on parliaments, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, we don't currently have a, a sitting parliament. Uh, that was the, the impact of the first February coup because they were about to take their seats. Um, my experience is that there was a long way to go in um, building the understanding of business and human rights in parliament. That partly reflected the background of the elected parliamentarians, um, most of whom, you know, had not been exposed to, to these issues before. But again, once you started talking to them about real life examples, and we, we went to see both human rights related committees in our upper and lower house back in, in January 2019 and took them through the guiding principles. And once we got over a, a kind of um, lots and lots of questions about company donations and what they called CSR and started to get into um, other examples people were bringing from their constituency around land rights issues, around pollution, then you could see that sort of, you know, the, um, the interest began to be, uh, be higher. It was only a limited discussion, but it was something we'd, we'd wanted to continue. But, but they were definitely coming from a, a, a very um, uh, low starting point. What we tried to do with Parliament was also identify some laws on their agenda which were going to have business and human rights elements. So at the time coming up, there was a draft occupational safety and health law, there was a children's rights law, there was an oil and gas law, there was amending the gemstones law. So we were flagging up that these were all laws that would come in front of them where they should be thinking, what are the human rights issues um, uh, which are being brought up in these laws? You know, how, that sh how should that be reflected? Again, we, we didn't get very far, but it was to try and stick it on the agenda. Um, to, to go back to the, the questions, uh, which, you know, we could be here until after lunch. Um, the oil and gas one, uh, so the question was around corporate complicity in oil and gas, uh, by oil and gas in, in Myanmar's human rights abuses. Um, we'll set aside the historical issues around the, the Unical um, total pipeline, forced labour and so on. I mean, that was a, um, a subject of, of multiple 
corporate liability suits in both the US and France and Belgium, uh, which are well documented, and that's you know, 15, 20 years ago. The, the hot issue now relates to the question of, is legal tax revenue in some way complicit in the human rights abuses of an authoritarian um, government? And uh, from the perspective of those um, uh, you know, arguing from the opposition side, it is, and therefore those companies should stop pe making payments. And it comes back down again to this question of, of the law. The companies themselves have analyzed, and I'm talking here particularly Total Chevron, I would put a Petronas PTT in a different box, um, and Daewoo, um, uh, or rather POSCO as they are now. Um, but they've looked at the different payments which are made and explained these to their stakeholders and in the one or two areas where they have the ability to suspend them, such as dividends from the pipeline, they've done so. However, there are other payments which are being made, which are not being made by those corporations themselves, Total and Chevron. They're being made by, for example, the buyer of the gas, PTT in Thailand. Um, so it, other than turning off the gas, so it doesn't go to either Thailand or Yangon, there is very little that the producer Total can do to stop that. Um, if there were to be sanctions legislation brought in, then perhaps that could address this. But this is something which the US, the EU, UK and others have been looking at. And I think the question is, is there an effective sanction to introduce and what would be the impacts of it? So from the from the perspective of the companies that I, I talked to, you know, Total and Chevron, it's, you know, if there is a legal way to do this, that's, that's absolutely the right of, of, the, com of the countries to, to do it. But from their perspective, they have done everything they can legally do to pause payments. Um, and the, the call to put payments into an escrow account and hold them for future de uh, generations, although superficially very attractive for, for all of us, doesn't have a legal base. Uh, and that's, that therefore is the problem for them. And if um, they do something which is illegal, what is the subsequent consequence? Now, on the one hand, some will argue, oh, well, they're so big that you know, nothing will happen to them. But on the other hand, um, some would argue actually they are um, highly profitable companies. And if they breach contracts, it's an opportunity for the, the military to step in and potentially other partners like PTT, the customer, and just take the whole thing over. And indeed, with Telenor, we've seen that as an opportunity. When Telenor leaves, somebody will pick up the pieces, um, and those pieces are relatively uh, valuable. Um, so, so these are all sort of these bigger questions around the impacts of exit, um, the impacts of, of action, and it's not, it's not simple, um, let's put it that way. There's been a, a lot of debate more generally about the question of, of tax. And if you go back to what John Ruggy said about this back in 2008, it was that there is no intention through the guiding principles to um, stop businesses from doing business in countries which have bad governance and stop them from paying tax. But I think there's always going to be those questions at the margins where tax payments are substantial and particularly where businesses are coming in knowing that they're going to be creating a revenue stream for uh, a, a human rights abusing government, that's where the question is, you know, should the company be doing it in, in the first place? So it's, it's complicated, I guess, is my summary to that. Um, the question of how can ASEAN address the Myanmar question, that's even more complicated or not. Um, I think that goes well beyond the, um, the topic here. Um, where ASEAN fits in in the business and human rights agenda, and that's beyond M Myanmar more generally, I do think that there should be some thought about where ASEAN can play a role on some of these cross-border impacts. And in particular, there's a, a, a point in the chat box from uh, CR Selva on uh, migrant labour um, uh, rights abuses and the transnational effects of, of that. Um, and the reason you know, that Malaysia is now tier three in the, in the trafficking in persons report. So I, I would encourage ASEAN to be looking at this agenda through some of those points, just as it's mentioned in your, your report, um, Singapore did it on transboundary haze and that became an, an ASEAN issue. You know, there are there's stuff like that where there is a value in ASEAN working, uh, working at a collective level. 
Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, great insights. I mean, all, all that, that you said about the tax question, you know, uh, providing revenues to an authoritarian government. I mean, it reminds me a lot of uh, the, the sort of work that's been done on the EITI, the Extractive, Industry, <clears throat> Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, um, which I think has been active in Myanmar. Uh, Indonesia it has, as well. it has been active. Yeah, it, it was very useful EITI and helped to make a lot of progress. But unfortunately, because of uh, the coup, um, it was suspended in February by the EITI because it was quite clear that the multi-stakeholder um, forum, uh, uh, multi-stakeholder body would not be able to function and civil society groups would not be able to function. So currently it's in suspense. But the, the five or six years that um, the data was collected have been very useful, including for, for some of the current debates which are going on today. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just so sorry to hear about the, the lack of progress on so many different fronts. I think the coup has really thrown a, a spanner in the works um, in Myanmar. Um, so we have still about like, you know, about 20 minutes or so before we close. So I'm going to ask the questions, uh, the remaining questions. And uh, if anybody else wants to jump in, um, and you feel free to please raise your hands as well if you'd like to raise questions and speak um, the questions yourself instead of putting on the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, so there's a question here about how do you think the governments of Southeast Asia will react in order to balance the economic deficits? So I suppose this is, you know, kind of post-pandemic situation. Um, in order to balance the human rights and the needed development in the context of this emerging crisis. And um, the, the second question is, is there a normative shift in the region towards acceptance of NAPs? So quite different questions, uh, not addressed to anyone in particular. Um, any of you can feel free to take that up. And then, as I said, uh, any one of you who would like to, to raise the question. Actually, uh, CR Selva, um, you raised also a good point, uh, which, which I think Vicky has touched on, but if you want to expand and elaborate on that a bit more, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I, and I can come to you in a bit. Um, Paolo? Yeah, the first question is referring to the, uh, the balance of... Uh... That's right. So like kind of, um, so on the one hand, balancing economic deficits uh, in order, and then on the other hand, uh, human rights I think that that's what the person is asking. So how, how governments of Southeast Asia will react in balancing uh, economic deficit and then balancing human rights and, and the needed development. So I think there's like three different, I think there's three different pillars that the person is trying to ask about. So governments are now grappling, right, on multiple fronts. Like you've got to balance this budget deficit because you have to spend uh, on aid and development, but on the other hand, also balancing human rights. So how can governments of Southeast Asia actually react to do this very uh, delicate balancing act? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a matter of communicating um, <clears throat> uh, the data that is that we have right now um, to the people because uh, th to those who are really affected by the pandemic, um, especially, especially, uh, the, the, the rights are, 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 are being highlighted in this situation. Um, so this is an opportunity, I think, for, for the governments to pursue other alternatives in terms of, um, letting them know that budgets are delegated properly to address human rights issues currently uh, in terms of health, in terms of uh, environmental protection, in terms of uh, COVID response, pandemic response. And, and I think uh, it's, it's, a good, it's, good, it's a good first step, it's a good opportunity uh, for, for governments to open up, to continue the discussions e even at the ASEAN level and to push for um, you know, uh, uh, alternative means that have not been uh, that have that have not been um, um, utilized by governments in uh, during the pre-pandemic time. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want to? I see. Okay. Sure. I, from where I'm sitting, I see that question of of governments balancing as 
a bit of a false dichotomy, but you know, I would say that in the belief that you know, human right or oh, development should should protect and respect human rights. But where I see it playing out in practice is over issues like minimum wage, um, where we we risk uh, a race to the bottom within ASEAN and, and beyond ASEAN if there is a perception that by, for example, raising the minimum wage, this will drive away investment and jobs. And obviously there has to be some balance struck because company, uh, countries need to be competitive to attract investment, but it shouldn't be at the total expense of the workers and them earning, as I mentioned, you know, in the case of Myanmar, now one third of the Cambodian minimum wage in, in comparative terms. So, so I think that's one of those areas where it would be nice to see some recognition at ASEAN level that, that this was a, a, a common area which should where they should work to try to, to raise standards rather than racing to the bottom. Those kind of things, of course, were you know, underlying the whole creation of the European Union, um, sort of trying to, to destroy unfair um, competition by, you know, whether it be subsidies or whether it be by, um, by running very low uh, labour costs. Um, the other area I'm concerned with is that, particularly in Myanmar, with uh, budget deficits, that there will be a push towards unsustainable explo exploitation of natural resources. Uh, and although this is something which we've not seen uh, formally, and indeed the, the military regime's announcements have tended to be in the opposite direction, uh, in, in reality, we know that that was what happened under the previous military regime in the 90s and 2000s, where we had a huge pressure on Myanmar's forests. Um, we had uh, pressure on, on minerals, um, jade, obviously, but also other, other minerals. So I'm, I'm concerned that we will see um, the opening up of areas to logging and mining, which should be protected. And part of the problem is that the normal mechanisms of protection from outside, such as the opportunity to either have responsible investment in those areas which doesn't you know, destroy, destroy the, uh, the environment, or climate finance you know, and carbon credits and so on, which will help to keep the trees standing. Those incentives are largely being denied Myanmar because people are just looking at Myanmar and saying, no way, you know, we're just not gonna do it. So, so that then actually exacerbates some of the unsustainable development trends that we, we may well see. Right, thank you. Um, so this has really been fascinating. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I've been asked to kind of like hand back to the organizers in about five minutes. So what I think I'll do is, uh, if nobody else has any questions, we'd just like to give the two of you uh, two minutes each for some closing thoughts. Um, how would you summarize your thoughts on this particular panel? Um, sort of kind of like reminding myself as well that the panel is on the NEPs. And there was that question earlier about uh, whether there is an increasing uptake of NEPs in the region. Um, so, Paolo, maybe just closing thoughts and maybe if you want to reiterate the points from your presentation as well, like what would you like the listeners and the readers to take home with you? Right. Um, I, I think it's, it's about time to start expanding the horizons of, uh, in, in business and human rights to, to really reach out to the parliaments. I mean, we, have, we, we in our network, the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats and our partner networks, um, this is really new to us. Uh, um, it, it would be good if, if there would be subcommittees in this subgroups in this regional grouping so that, so that, uh, you know, the exposure to these kinds of, um, discussions would be, uh, would benefit not just the network, but also the country they are, they represent. So, it, and again, let's, let's, Let's make let's focus on the process because let's we have to emphasize that uh, human rights it's it's something that we should relate to um, beyond the concepts beyond the projections of of strategies. Um, what's important is 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 the message that that we want to to share to our networks in terms of uh, whether whether or not. It's responsible business conduct, uh, you know, uh, business and human rights, all these terminologies, as long as the standards are based on, on probably the UN guiding principles and its three pillars, 
uh, we'll be able to to focus on on the policies we want to produce to conduct uh, you know, human rights due diligence and effective remedies for business um, impacts. So I think that's it. Thank you for for the panel. Thank you, Trisha, and thank you to Asia Center. Congratulations. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, we look forward to um, seeing Cal uh, do more in this regard. So we look forward to the more of Cal involvement. Uh, Vicky. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't have much to add other than in response to that question about is it a sort of the normative trend that um, countries in, in ASEAN are starting to, to adopt NAPs? I mean, on paper, not really, but as the report sets out, there is a discussion going on. And I think one of the things that we should be very thankful for is Thailand's uh, role model in this. It is certainly not perfect, but then no NAP I've ever read is, is perfect and flawless. And it always leaves some people dissatisfied. And there's been a lot of talk uh, in the report about you know, using shall rather than must. I, I think personally that's overblown. I think it, it, it misrepresents what an app is. It's not, it's not a legal document, it's, it's an action plan. Um, so I think we should be thankful to, for Thailand for, for um, uh, being the first to do this. We should learn from that process. Uh, you know, and other countries in the region should, should learn and build on that um, because it is part of a much wider sustainable development debate. Um, and it is one which has UN endorsement through the guiding principles. And in the end, what you find is, you know, most countries do actually pay attention to what the UN does, obviously through periodic reviews and you know, convention um, commitments. But more generally, countries want to be seen to be working in line with, with what the United Nations um, calls for. So I, I'm sort of positive that there will be uh, be trends and uptake, and I and I really do thank Thailand for having taken that first step. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Paolo. Thank you, Vicky. Um, we are right on time, and I just want to close by uh, thanking the panelists. Uh, apologies to the rest that we did not manage to get our third speaker, but um, I think on the bright side, we managed to get a really in-depth discussion going, and I, I appreciate all the comments from both of you. Uh, I'd like to pass the time now back to um, the Asia Centre. So back to you, Dr. Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia, and thank you to uh, our, our two speakers. Yes, uh, unfortunately, our third speaker had some technical issues. But we nevertheless had a very interesting uh, and productive uh, uh, panel uh, discussion. Um, before I, I, I make some uh, uh, concluding remarks, I maybe will just throw out a second poll to you. Uh, and uh, in light of what Paolo and Vicky have been presenting, uh, the question is, uh, speaking of should, um, should parliamentarians play a role in advocating for and developing national action plans? And so um, that's the poll uh, question. We will come back to that uh, in a second. Um, I would also, so yes or no. Uh, secondly, I would just like to invite participants to uh, take our, our survey. So there you have the QR code. Please do uh, share your thoughts. Uh, on the event, take a few minutes to complete the survey and give us your feedback. Let me just um, say uh, some, make some uh, remarks about the the, the panel um, that we have uh, just uh, listened to. Uh, just some key points. I think, from our perspective uh, at Asia Center, uh, it. The, the overall theme that we are hearing, and the and I think the what the thrust of our report uh, is that um, the BHR discussion is clearly part of uh, the regional landscape. It can play uh, an, a part in promoting and protecting human rights, so definitely. And NAPs are one component, but a very uh, concrete part of this process. Uh, yes, they are a policy document. It is not a, a, a legal document, but nevertheless, uh, as NAPs get better, uh, they can and should uh, better align with uh, international human rights standards uh, 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 as we uh, improve. Uh, support in the take up of NAPs can help contribute towards democracy uh, and human rights in the country. And so, 
NAPs can and should contribute to uh, deepening, localizing and deepening the culture of human rights and democracy in the region. And to the extent that they contribute to doing that, uh, that is most welcome. And this is why we suggest this uh, greater, better alignment uh, uh, with uh, uh, international human rights language uh, and standards. Uh, NAPs are, of course, as Vicky has rightly said, are, are one piece of the puzzle. They are an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, and she also mentioned that we need to have more imaginative uh, ways of raising awareness, uh, uh, which uh, Vicky uh, uh, pointed out and Tricia, you pointed out uh, as well. So as we come to the close of, of this panel, perhaps um, let's have a look at the result. Oh, well, there it is. Uh, okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a very clear. Uh, Paolo, you have uh, your work cut out for you along, and we are happy to collaborate uh, and engage in this area uh, with our partners. Uh, Parli 100 percent of you say, say yes parliamentarians should take uh, those who participated in the poll uh, 26 uh, of the 38 say yes uh, uh, parliamentarians should absolutely be, be involved so um let me uh take this uh, time as we move towards the end of panel one to remind you about uh, asia center's seventh international conference uh, freedom of Expression in Asia, uh, which will take place next year uh, from 24 to 26th of August uh, uh, 2022. Um, please be reminded uh, that our second panel is coming up and you see the panelists here. Uh, the, the panel will be uh, uh, specifically panel two on business organizations and NAPs prospects for advancing the BHR agenda. And so it will be moderated by uh, Husai Chantara Wirod from the uh, FNF, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung. And uh, you see uh, our speakers before you who will be properly introduced uh, as we uh, start uh, panel two. So please uh, uh, do uh, stay with us, uh, join us at two o'clock uh, from two to four uh, for this, uh, uh, second um, uh, panel uh, as part of our webinar. So thank you for this morning, for attending this morning, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at two o'clock. See you soon. Thank you.